thanks for being here this morning and thanks to the Creative Mornings team for setting this up and thanks to Capital University for hosting us here. I'm here to talk to you about what it means to be an American, at least as I see it. My name is Elvis Saldias. I'm a DACA recipient, a, also known as a dreamer, if you've heard of that in the news. If you haven't, I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is in a minute. And I'm also an advocate. I advocate around issues uh, involving immigration and things in that matter. And a little bit about myself today. I, I live in Columbus, although I'm not originally from Columbus. I moved here to attend Ohio State University. And I finished about two years ago. And then I worked at Nationwide Insurance, doing boring insurance stuff for <laughs> about two years. And that took me to about now. And I left that company. I've been involved in other things. Um, and I'm preparing to go to law school, which has been my dream for a really long time. It comes with challenges with my status. Um, anyhow, I also want to tell you a little bit about where I come from, so, so my beginnings prior to Columbus, prior to Ohio, and, and where I'm actually from, which is a country named Bolivia. I'm, I'm Bolivian, or at least I was born there. And Bolivia is a landlocked country in South America, and it is bordered by Peru on the northwest, Chile and Argentina on the south and, and the west, and then Brazil, because Brazil is a huge country and encompasses the rest of it. It's a small country, about 10 million people. It's about the size of Ohio population-wise, but it's about the size of California and Texas put together geographically. So that's where I'm from. I'm from a city named Santa Cruz, which is the, the largest city there in Bolivia. And here is a picture of me as, as a little kid. I was probably two or three years old here, dancing with my sister, Vanya, with my really cool shoes there. <laughs> and I was born and raised in Bolivia up until the age of nine. I spoke only Spanish. I didn't know any English. Had I not moved to the United States, I wouldn't be able to talk to you in English today. I'd be talking to people in, in Spanish, my, my native language. And I had a more or less regular life there. I was a, from a middle class family. In 2001, my mother decided that it was good to try and come to the USA for better economic opportunities. We secured a three month tourist visa, which is a visa that you get as you're able to show that maybe you, you have reason to be a tourist. You, you have money to spend. I, I don't think we had the money to spend. I believe that she borrowed money, took a loan out to show that we had something to do here. And that's the only way we were able to, to gain entrance to the country. Because otherwise, you really cannot uh, immigrate illegally probably from Bolivia just because of how far it is. It'd be quite the trip to try and come from South America up through the different countries and then through Mexico, right, and through the southern border. So I did fly into the USA on a, on a three-month visa. This picture here is my first um, Christmas or Christmas time here in the USA. My mother, my sister, and myself. My mother was 30 at the time. I was nine. My sister was 11. And the original plan was to come to this country and stay here for a year, maybe two, at least as my mother tells me. She just wanted to work and uh, save up some money and then head back. She was an information technology student at a university in Santa Cruz. And she was married, but they had had some issues. And I, maybe I think she saw it as a way to, to get away from that for a little bit, think about things, and then maybe go back. That was in 2001. I'm still here. So clearly, that didn't go according to plan, right? <laughs> so I'm going on 17, almost 18 years here. So it's quite a while. Most of my life at this point has been spent in the United States and Ohio. And when I look at those two pictures, I also realize something else. Now, I am young here, and I am a little bit older here. But this kid seems a lot more worried about things. He looks like he's thinking about some stuff. And, and that is true, because you know, we had a, a three-month visa, and pretty much I, I knew what my status was. I knew I was undocumented. I, um, 
I'd never, it was never hidden from me. You know, Elvis, you're, you're, a, you're just a, a regular kid. I, I was regular in some ways, right? But uh, as far as my status, I always knew I was undocumented. I knew I was different from the other fourth graders in my classroom. Aside from the fact that it was hard to assimilate at first because things are different here. The, the weather is colder. I came from a tropical um, climate. I didn't speak any English again. I had to learn all of this. I had to read a lot and I had to assimilate quickly. And it was tough because I knew that I was different. And being undocumented as a child is one thing. Being undocumented as an adult is another thing. It, it, it tends to get harder. So I want to tell you now a little bit more about the way I grew up uh, in terms of being undocumented. And I'll get to the being American part here in a minute, but I want to tell you a little bit about my upbringing. So as I, as I cited, the knowledge of being different, the knowledge of having your mother drive around in Ohio without a, a driver's license, basically driving illegally, because in my little small town, I, I, we moved to outside of Toledo, a, a small town called Wasian. It's about 30 minutes west. It's a white working class town. You have to drive there. There is no such thing as public transportation. You have to do things like that. And you also have to find work, because that's the nature of being an immigrant in the United States. You come here to work. You don't come here really to do much else. And that's what my mother was engaged in as a single mother raising two young children. And you grow up with that fear of your parents maybe having to go somewhere else or, or maybe something happening and you having to go back to a country perhaps that you don't feel at home at anymore. So I, I grew up with those burdens on my shoulder. And also with the economic woes that came with it, Apart from being a child of a single mother that was working class, I was also undocumented. It presented a lot of financial barriers for her. She wasn't able to gain access to the, to the jobs that other people with her skill sets would be able to, to gain access to. So um, for us, that meant you know, thrift stores. That meant going to Aldi's, which is still a, a great thing today, but you know, it's, uh, it, is, it is a lot cheaper. That's what I grew up doing. It meant uh, living in a, in a trailer park. I grew up largely in a trailer park and in, in a bedroom. Once I had a bedroom, because I didn't always have a bedroom. I usually slept in the same room as my mom. But once I had a bedroom, a bedroom that I could touch both walls like this. So it was a really, really small uh, old laundry room turned bedroom type style. And uh, for me, as I got older, right, I said earlier, as a kid, it's not so bad because you're just a kid. You don't have many responsibilities. As I turned 16, 17 and 18, as I was ending high school and I wanted to do other things, I started coming across the problems that a lot of undocumented adults run into, which is I also wasn't able to drive. I was, I couldn't drive to school. I wanted to work because I saw that there was a need for income in my family. I also wasn't able to work. Legally, I wasn't able to hold a job. If I did hold a job, it'd be something irregular like shoveling snow or maybe I, I used to referee soccer games, things like that. And uh, I also grew increasingly frustrated with the lack of a path to citizenship. You know, at 18, I speak English the way I speak English now in the sense that you really can't tell I'm, I'm, I'm from a different country. I, I more or less have assimilated in that respect. And um, there was no avenue for me to get papers. And I want to ask the audience a question here because this is something that comes up a lot in, in my experience. There's a disconnect between what people think is the reason that people are undocumented and, and the reason that people are undocumented. So anybody here know? So we have, for, for context, we have about 11 million undocumented immigrants in the USA. About a million and a half to two million are dreamers, like myself, who came here at a certain age. We were, we were kids. Um, what are some thoughts that you guys have on why we have so many undocumented immigrants? Why do you think that? People are not able to, to fix their status or you know, get in line or so. Anybody have any, any guesses as to why? Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy? OK. It's expensive. It's expensive? OK. There really isn't a line. Not a line? OK. You just have to actually apply outside of the United States. That's one way. Yeah, those are all, those are all reasons. The main reason is that there is no pathway to citizenship. So currently, I'm, I'm a college grad. I'm gainfully employed. I've been here long enough in Ohio. I graduated high school here. There's no, there's no law that says, Elvis, because you, you're X and X and X, you can get in this process. 
To be sure, money is a factor, but money is only a factor once you are even able to have that process. The millions and millions of people that are here undocumented is because they don't have a pathway to citizenship. Um, they don't have any way to apply for it. It simply doesn't exist. This is what the whole crux about immigration reform is, to try and make a way for people that have been here for a while, that are part of our communities, to, to be able to apply, because these people just can't apply. People like myself, we, we cannot apply for citizenship, we cannot apply for green cards, as things currently stand, unless the law changes. Now, I also want to talk to you about the other side of my life. I, it wasn't all just, you know, hardship. I was just a kid from Ohio. I, I was riding my bike everywhere, I was active athletically, I, I had friends. Nobody in my community really knew I was undocumented because I didn't feel comfortable sharing that as, uh, as a kid growing up. And I did assimilate well. Like I said, I, I speak English. Um, I was doing the other things that, my, that other kids in, at my age were doing. I'm, you know, regrettably a, a Cleveland Browns fan. Uh, I picked that up from Ohio. I didn't know a thing about football before coming here, um, but I'm, I'm a Cleveland Browns fan now. And uh, I was otherwise just a regular American teen. I went to things like homecoming, uh, you know, prom. I was involved in sports. In high school, I was the captain of my soccer team. I was good, but I wasn't good enough to play in college. But it's still, it's still a fun sport. And then I was able to go to college, uh, not through conventional ways, but I was able to enroll at a community college, go part time, and, and pay my way through it out of pocket, because that's the way it had to be done. And then now I want to tell you a little bit about DACA. DACA is an acronym. Maybe you've heard it in the news, maybe not. It's an acronym that stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It was introduced by President Obama in 2012 as a, as a means to remedy, temporarily remedy a, a situation which people like myself found ourselves in, is that we were growing up in this country in the shadows, outside of the workforce, outside of any official recognition, and also through his frustration that Congress would not do anything to address this issue. There was too much lock in Congress, and nothing was being done for one reason or another. And the benefits of DACA are essentially two things. It gives you a work permit, which allows you to work legally, allows you to have a job more commensurate with your skills. The work permit gives you a social security number, those things give you something like a driver's license. I got DACA when I was 20 years old. Prior to being 20 years old, I didn't have anything that said who I was, where I lived, any type of formal official ID I did not have. Imagine being an adult and not having any type of ID to recognize you. You feel left out and you feel out of place and that's how millions still feel. And then deferred action was the second part of it. Deferred action says, the Department of Justice does not see you as DACA recipients as a priority for deportation. Up until then, everything was fair game. I'm at least protected from that now as long as I have the status, which goes every two years. Um, as a result, a lot of doors opened. I was able to get a job that was better. Uh, when I was in, at community college, I was working at a, at a restaurant as a cook. I wasn't making much, it was, it was hard work. As soon as I got DACA, I left. And I got a job driving a forklift at an automobile supplier. It was a lot of hours. It was third shift. But it was what I had to do to, for my next plan, my next move, which was to go to a four-year university, because I always wanted to do that. And those are some of the doors that open as a result of DACA. And by the way, DACA, the, the, the people that qualify are kids who came here before the age of 16, before 2007, and ones who have absolutely no criminal background, you have to pass a criminal background, a comprehensive one, you have to pay some fees, and you have to check in with the government every two years. I have to go do fingerprints every two years. You know, the government knows all of my information. And the current state of DACA, which is maybe what you've heard of in the news, is that about a year ago, the Department of Justice, led by the now exited Jeff Sessions, said that the program was unconstitutional. And that was led by the Trump administration. President Trump campaigned on this being an unconstitutional program that was not benefiting anybody, that was subverting the law, more or less. So they got rid of it. They gave Congress six months to pass some legislative solution to it, because up in DACA was an executive administration solution to a problem as opposed to a law that actually passed. 
They gave Congress six months. That's when it came up in the news a lot. That's when I started advocating a lot more on the issue because I realized that this is my status. This is the reason I'm able to work. This is the reason that I'm able to drive and do a bunch of other things. So I had to fight for it. And I started doing events where I try to inform the public, try to do some media, so and so. Anyways, six months pass and Congress, perhaps true to form, doesn't get something done. It just, you know, no laws get passed, regrettably. Some of that was Congress. A lot of that was also the president wanting something that was far right on immigration as opposed to what was being able to, to, to give. And, and currently, as of Wednesday, the news with DACA is that it is, um, it is going to be argued in the Supreme Court in about five or so months. And I think that with the political leanings of the Supreme Court, it, it, I think there's a chance that it'll get struck down. And I'm not sure what happens. I'm not sure if it phases out immediately or if it lasts a little bit. Um, I'm also not sure if perhaps Congress will have a lot more pressure to get something done. I know that most Americans support people like myself being in the country. So I think something, I'm optimistic that something will happen, but it does make it hard to plan for the future. It makes it hard to plan for a year out. Like I said, I want to go to law school. It makes it hard to plan for two years out as a, as a young working professional. So those are some of the challenges and in, in what, in what DACA is. And then I also want to talk to you about American uh, values. And I want to see what the audience thinks are some American values. Uh, so anybody here, like, what are some values that you associate with, with being American? Ideals, okay. Ingenuity. Liberty. Ingenuity. Ingenuity. Right, under one. Freedoms. Freedoms. Equality. Equality, right, that's a big one. Yeah, so those are some very fair American values. And uh, I have some up here that I, that I came up with doing research. I think productivity was one of the biggest ones that I saw simply because Americans work really, really hard. In Bolivia, I did not see any third shift factories. In Ohio, there's a ton of third shift factories. People are working all the time. America, America is a very industrious nation. And America changes a lot. And there is a strong component of the law here in America. And America is diverse. There's people from all across the world here, different languages, different ideas. And there's a commitment to country. Um, and like you said, equal protection under the law, or at least that ideal. These are some other values, freedom obviously being a big one. Uh, being yourself, you know, Americans tend to walk with an air of confidence and uh, even if heading in the wrong direction. Uh, <laughs> and um, in pursuit, something like the American dream. I think immigration is inherently American. I think most of us here come from, from somewhere else, whether it was this decade or last century or, or the previous century. We're very connected to immigration. There's a sense of pride being American. And something I noticed when I moved to the USA too, America is a very individualistic society. And in Latin America, you know your extended family a lot more. A lot of extended families live together. There's a more communal feel to it. America is more individualistic and perhaps that comes with the productivity. Um, so those are some of the values that I saw that were very American. And those are also some of the values that, that I value growing up here and some of the values that helped me get ahead from my economic situation that I, that I was in growing up. And then as I thought about these things and I thought about, you know, am I American or not? Um, I don't think I grew up under the idea that I was American. I didn't feel accepted by this country. Like I said, I didn't have an ID. I still can't leave the country willingly. Um, lots of things that made me feel excluded from, from America. However, I do feel American now. And for me, becoming American or so was a journey. It wasn't something that kind of just snapped into place. It took a lot of self-reflecting as I became an adult to think about my life, to think about some of the things that had happened, and to see that it was truly an American story. It was you know, rising up and, and working and being scrappy and, and being hungry and trying to get educated and more. Uh, things that Americans have been engaged with since the founding of this country. And um, as, as I reflected on those values, I also thought 
for this talk, I was trying to define what it means to be an American. And I realized it's a complex question, and I don't know that I can define it. But I think that there is one meaning to be American to somebody, and there's another meaning to be American to somebody else. Like I said, I think it's a hard question to define. I don't know that there is a definition. I think it's mostly loosely tied to those values that I showed up there. And I think it can mean something different for different people. Being an American could mean something different for a white man in Wasian in Northwest Ohio where I'm from than it could mean to, to a Hispanic family in San Antonio. It would mean something different to an African American woman in the Bronx than it would be to a, um, you know, like an Indian family in Houston or so. It, it's a different thing. Um, but it comes under that ideal of diversity, but also assimilation, like we're different, but it's also a melting pot, so together we're just one, right? E pluribus unum. And when I thought about what makes me an American, the thing that stood out the most was something that I've been engaged in the last two or three years, which was essentially fighting for rights that I think I deserve and I, rights that I think millions of other people deserve, which is the value of civic engagement. I thought civic engagement is one of the most American things you can do. It utilizes your experience. It utilizes the freedom that you have to speak on anything. It utilizes um, a democracy, right? Because somebody has to listen to you. And this photo here is me in, in Washington, D.C. about a year ago, around the time that the news came out on DACA, saying that, um, that it was going to be rescinded. I, I went and visited a couple of legislators. Anybody know who that is in the white shirt there? Senator Portman, senator Portman that's correct. He's a Republican from, from Ohio, a senator, and he's a, he's a powerful person. And we went and talked to him. I believe I was explaining something about DACA and the situation. He has different ideas than me, right? But I was trying to change his mind on some issues. And although we didn't ultimately succeed in the sense that there was legislation passed, I think it's good for people like him to see the faces behind the stats or behind the positions that they're either for or either against. And that's what I've been engaged in doing. Much like the early Americans, the founding fathers who fought for liberty from Britain and King George, the, you know, the idea of not, not having to be taxed unless you're being represented, democracy in other words, to the, to the folks who fought for the idea of freedom from slavery, to women's suffrage, to the civil rights movement, to immigrant rights today, we're, we're fighting for that. that. That's the civic engagement that I'm engaged in. And to me, I think that's, that's what it means to be an American. Uh, to be an American means fighting for your rights, at least in my case. And in conclusion, my, my name is Elvis Seldius again, and I'm an undocumented American. And what it means to be an American to me is being civically engaged. And that's my talk.